peace, blessing, and every welcome to you as you join us today at St. Philip's Episcopal Church here in Nashville, Tennessee. We're so pleased you're able to join us for our service of worship. We are going to be uh, celebrating the Holy Eucharist, right too. If you have a Book of Common Prayer at home, uh, that service will begin on page 355 after the opening song. And the opening song today is called How Firm a Foundation. How Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and on peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, friends. It is so good to be with you. This morning, I want to talk to you about um, a man who lived the prayer of St. Francis. We've been We've been talking about this prayer for many weeks, and we've been talking about how we want God to make us instruments of God's peace. And we've heard that where there's hatred, we're called to sow seeds of love. Where there's despair, we sow seeds of hope. Where there's been injury, where, where wrong has happened, we're called to sow seeds of reparation and forgiveness. And in all of these things, what we're really asking of God is, God, make us instruments of your peace. And so, God, give us the strength to work for your justice, to work for your justice. In the Bible, 
Justice is about relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with the creation, with the earth, with the animals, the plants and trees, and relationship with our neighbor. That there are ways in which we can live God's peace out by treating other people as we would want to be treated. And this is what the prayer is. And so without justice, there can be no peace. And so this last week, we lost uh, a dear brother in the Honorable Representative John Lewis. And John Lewis was uh, a civil rights leader, a congressional leader, a black man who over the course of his life stood up to make the world a more just and peaceful place. And so I wanted to share a couple things about John Lewis this week and then encourage you to ask your, your mommies and daddies and, and other parentals um, more about John Lewis because there's so much to know. But I want you to know about John Lewis that he was uh, from a very young age loved God. He was given a Bible when he was four years old and his mother read it to him and by five he could read it himself. And the other thing that I think is funny and that St. Francis, who was a lover of animals, would love is that John Lewis had a special love for chickens. He lived on his family farm and loved chickens and his love for God and the Bible and his love for chickens came together. And John Lewis would often practice preaching because he wanted to be a preacher. He would practice preaching to the chickens. And he would, he even would baptize the chickens. And he says in one of his uh, autobiographies, he says, I really wanted to save the little chicken souls. <laughs> and so I love John Lewis and I love his love for God and for animals. And as he grew up as a black man living in the South, they, he realized that he was treated because of his black skin more differently than those with white skin. And so John Lewis stood up because he loved God's peace and loved God's justice and said no. And so whenever he would see injustice, whenever he would see something wrong, people being treated wrongly, John Lewis would stand up for them. John Lewis would stand up for himself. You see, John Lewis knew that all lives mattered to God. And John Lewis knew that in this country, all lives couldn't matter until black lives mattered. And so John Lewis spent his life, uh, whether it was marching, whether it was registering people to vote in elections, whether it was passing laws in Congress, John Lewis stands as an example to us as Christians of the way we can be involved in making this country better. And by making our country better, being more faithful to obey God's command to us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so, my dear ones, if you wish to be instruments of peace, you should learn this week more about John Lewis as we continue to pray for his family and those who loved him and to thank God for his work. So I hope you all have such a good week and I look forward to talking to you more next week. So God's peace be with you, okay? Bye-bye. Peace. A reading from the first book of Kings. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people. 
able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is a portion of Psalm 119. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore I obey them with all my heart. When your word goes forth, it gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, I long for your commandments. Turn to me in mercy, as you always do those who love your name. Steady my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Rescue me from those who oppress me, and I will keep your commandments. Let your countenance shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears, because people do not keep your law. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sights too deep for words, and God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also pre predestined to to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he pristined, he also called. And those whom he called, he, he also justified. As well as them he justified, he also glorified. When then are we, are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own Son but gave him up for all of us, will he not get with him also give us everything else? Will Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being, being killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. Know in all these things that we are more than, than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your Alleluia. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. Fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. The 
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. My friends, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, Lord Christ. Good morning, St. Philippians. It's good to be with you again, even in this virtual setting. Greetings from Swanee. We stand on the cusp of a new school year for both the children at Swanee Elementary and for myself at seminary. We are full of trepidation as the best laid plans are to begin a new semester. I bid your prayers while I offer my own as we all figure out how to live in safety in this difficult time. Thank you again for your support and love that you show to me and my family. I want to start this morning with a story. This particular story took place several weeks ago. Our family routine had taken shape around the constant 24-hour care that my mother-in-law Teresa required as she approached her final days. Jana would stay with her, nursing her and attending to her needs. And then she would return home when her sister Emily came to relieve her. My roles oscillated between caregiver for our children and caregiver for Jana when she returned home. On this particular morning, Jana arrived home in better spirits and better rested than she had been in a long time. It seemed like I had scarcely left the house in weeks, so I asked if she felt well enough for me to go out for a short drive. Swanee is a beautiful place to be quarantined, don't get me wrong, but over time, the children and I had done all the hikes that we were physically able to do, and the thought of another long walk exhausted me more than the physical reality of actually doing it. So she happily agreed, and I set out in the car with no particular intention, just enjoying the air, the radio, and some solitude. There is an almost auto-hypnosis effect that driving in the car can have on me sometimes. Before I knew it, I found myself in Monteagle, the next town over from where we live in Swanee. I came upon a church that sits in front of a big flea market there. I noticed they had a sign out front. My eyes scanned across it briefly while trying to main maintain my attention on the road. If it weren't for the brevity of the message, I may have missed it. Two words were boldly on display. Pray harder. My breath almost involuntarily went out of my body as if I'd been punched directly in the middle of my chest. I had to find a place to pull over so that I could safely fall apart. I don't want to deliver that type of message to you this morning. Pray harder? If you're like me, you can honestly say you might be tired of praying or don't know what to pray for anymore, or every 30 seconds you have a news alert or a message from a friend and are frenzied and scattered and afraid. Maybe even at our best, as Father Wineland described last week, 
we are living our best superficial life. Or in the words of Martin Luther, we are curved in on ourselves, preoccupied with our own needs. Luckily, we have some incredible words of consolation from the epistle reading today. St. Paul writes, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Prayer is such a simple act sometimes. We use it to share our concerns and burdens with one another. Even on social media, we see constant prayer requests. But it, prayer can also be a deep mystery to discover the truth about how we connect with God. Julia Gada, one of my professors at seminary here and the author of the book Life in Christ, which many of you in EFM may be familiar, she taught me something so profound about prayer. Paul teaches that prayer does not start with our fledgling efforts, but with God's Holy Spirit stirring within us. The Spirit prompts that, prompts that holy restlessness that yearns for contact with God, even though we scarcely know how to begin. God is no distant deity who might just listen to us if we could only get our act together or find the right words or formula. God is not a passive-aggressive partner in this affair, eyeing us with detachment as we flail about trying to get his attention. Far from playing hard to get, the Spirit starts the process by wooing us, wooing us into prayer. The desire that we feel is implanted by the Spirit. We have only to respond. When we don't know how to pray, what to pray, when we feel like we don't know where to start, when we feel unworthy, unlistened to, when the church sign in Mont Eagle tells us we have failed to pray hard enough, the Spirit is active within us. So what is the Spirit up to? Paul says the Spirit is praying for us with sighs, even some Bible translations say groanings, sighs, groanings, involuntary expressions of deep connection and compassion that transcend words. At that moment when I was gut punched by the notion that I had failed to pray hard enough, that when my mother-in-law was dying of cancer, I didn't pray hard enough, that when violence is perpetrated on people of color because I didn't pray hard enough, that we live in fear that we or those who we love will contract a deadly virus because I didn't pray hard enough, that all the cares and worries that I was carrying with me on my little drive to Mont Eagle one morning, all those things were crushing me because I didn't pray hard enough? While all that was going on, the Spirit was working and doing the thing that I couldn't do, uttering those wordless, impassioned groans for comfort, for justice, for a miracle cure. The Spirit was praying even when I couldn't. But to what end? So I could just feel better because some thoughtless but probably well-meaning people put some words on their sign that hurt my feelings? Paul explains further. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to se separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
the Spirit's preemptive prayer within us is wooing us, showing us that there is a way. We are drawn into relationship, into the divine love that the Trinity shares. This is the reality of God's redemptive love in the world. And every small awakening to that reality in and through prayer is a step toward realizing our true identities as adopted, chosen children of God. Paul and the Christians in Rome faced their own sorts of challenges. He had his list of obstacles that stopped him in his tracks. He found that deep connection, being wooed by the Spirit to pray. He encountered the love of Christ and the power of his resurrection and was moved to articulate his certainty of the dream of God coming to bear in a world where his fellow believers were fiercely persecuted and faced death. He said, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? I am convinced, he says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, none of these things will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He was convinced. I wish I could be so certain, so convinced. I am almost convinced that there will be an end someday to this global pandemic. I'm almost convinced that there will be justice. I'm almost convinced that there will be a way to grieve well those who we love but see no more. I'm almost convinced. I'm getting there, and my hope is that with God's help, and us helping one another, we can all become more fully convinced every day of the reality of the indelible marks of God's love on us, our souls and bodies. That we can more fully participate in the unfolding reality of the redemption of the world by the one who loves us and groans along with us. Amen. I invite you now to declare your faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. You can find this on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. Brothers and sisters, God commands us through Jesus Christ to love and serve one another as Jesus loved and served all of humanity. In baptism, we promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, to strive for justice and peace, and to respect the dignity of every human being. Let us now honor those vows and pray for the needs of others throughout our country and the world. 
We pray that all elected and appointed officials would be called to a vocation of peacemaking, which promotes nonviolent solutions to every conflict. For the President of the United States, Congress and the Supreme Court, the Governor of Tennessee, and the Mayor of Nashville. We pray for a speedy end to all violence and warfare around the world. O God of peace and gentleness, hear our prayer. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for John, our bishop, for the Church of the Diocese of Littoral, Ecuador, and for Bishop Cristobal Leon. In the, in the diocesan cycle of prayer, we remember St. Luke's Community House, Nashville. O God of grace and unity, hear our prayer. We pray for all nations that they may live in unity, peace, and concord, and that all people may know justice and enjoy the perfect freedom that only God can give. O God of the burning bush, hear our prayer. We pray for an end to prejudice throughout our country and the world, that we will respect all people as precious children of God, and that discrimination based on race, gender, age, and disability will be forever banished from our hearts, our society, and our laws. O God, in whom there is no, neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek, hear our prayer. We pray for all immigrants, refugees, pilgrims from around the world, that they may be welcomed in this society and be treated with fairness, dignity, and respect. O God, whose holy family fled to Egypt to escape the tyranny of Herod, hear our prayer. We pray for the men and women serving our country in the armed forces, Casey Feather, Robert Higgins, Michael House, Caleb Dozier, Dalton Branson, and Peyton Downs. For our postulants for holy orders, Charlie McLean and his family, and Katie Ray and her family. We pray for all those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. We pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Charlie, Sarah, Jana, Olivia, Jennifer, Wayne, Kaylee, Genevieve, Curtis, Robin, Mickey, the Franklin family, the Zamer family, and for Jerry. We pray for all prisoners and captives, especially Miles and Paul, that a spirit of forgiveness may replace vengeance and retribution, and that we, with all the destitute, lonely, and oppressed, may be restored to the fullness of God's grace through the power of the cross of Christ. O God of absolution and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that all may come within the reach of your saving embrace, and for the church throughout the world, that she may be an instrument of your peace and joy. O God of all health and salvation, hear our prayer. We pray for all who have died as a result of violence, war, disease, or famine, and for all both known and unknown to us that have died due to the COVID-19 virus. We pray for those who have died in the communion of your church and those who, whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. O oh God of shalom and mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Watch over our country now and in the days ahead. Guide our leaders and the people they have been elected to serve. Teach them the knowledge and truth of your ways. In the passion of debate, give them a quiet spirit. In the midst of things hard to comprehend, give them clear discernment and courageous hearts. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. La paz del Señor sea siempre contigo. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another. Peace be with you. God's peace. Again, we're so pleased you're able to join us for our service of worship today here at St. Philip's Episcopal Church. We have a special guest musician today. It's my wife, Lee Armstrong Wineland. Can you see Lee in the shot, uh, Matt? Okay, great. Okay, yeah, we're so glad that she's able to join us today. Serving at the altar is uh, Dan Cochran. Uh, our technical director today is Matt Bach, and we're so glad for that. Our, our regular technical director, Chuck Hardy, and his uh, family are on vacation and hope they have a blessed vacation and a good rest. Uh, there are several things going on in our church. We still have our food pantry happening uh, as part of Second Harvest. That happens here two days a week. The schedule is on our website. Um, also, the, um, uh, the knitwits, the folks who do the knitting of prayer shawls, they are still active and, uh, and, uh, and going strong here in the, in the church. And I wanted to uh, give a shout out to them. They gave us some prayer shawls to be blessed last week and that was terrific. And keep, keep it up, sisters, it, it, it's great, great work. Uh, you, are, you are invited to make uh, an offering to St. Philip's Episcopal Church and the ministry here uh, and beyond. Uh, you can do that uh, by punching a button on our website and it's pretty simple and we would invite you to do that. Um, on the every other week, we have a Zoom coffee hour. We just had one last Sunday, uh, the 19th. We'll be having another one two weeks hence. Uh, so please feel free to join us. If you'd like to join in that group, that Zoom coffee fellowship hour, send an email to the church. We'll make sure you get an invitation. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
We're celebrating the service of Holy Eucharist beginning on page 361 of the Book of Common Prayer. This service of Holy Communion is given for the glory of God and with special intention to honor the life and reconciling work of our brothers John Lewis and C.T. Vivian. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemptional Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offered you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace and at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. My sisters and brothers, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God, holy food for holy people. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Christ, 
blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Again, many thanks to Matt Bach for filling in as our technical director, doing an excellent job for Dan Cochran serving here at the altar, for my wife Lee, for being our guest musician this week, and to all our readers and everyone who behind the scenes made this service of worship possible. We are grateful and blessed. May the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit who broods over the world as a mother over her children, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing song today is entitled, In Christ Alone. In Christ Alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah.